today's scripture is John chapter 1. I'm going to read from verse 29 to 34. I'll read verse 29. You read verse 30. And we'll alternate and read the last verse together. Okay, are you Jimby Hay? Yes, okay. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel, therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And, and I have, have seen and testify that this is the Son of God. God. In ancient Greece, there is the myth of Icarus, who was, who was, who was imprisoned on an island. And Icarus' father made him false wings of wax. And with these wings, Icarus was allowed to escape from the island that he was imprisoned on. But, but Icarus was warned, don't fly too close to the sun. If you fly too close to the sun, your wings will melt away. Now I think this sermon as we read John chapter 1, verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, behold, look with wonder. The NIV says, look, and write at these words, Behold, see, Icarus, he, he had a problem that he wanted to be so close to the sun. Icarus wanted to see the sun, and as he flew higher and higher, these wax wings that he had, fell off, and he fell into the sea. And when we come to John chapter 1, verse 29, Behold with amazement, look with wonder. John is saying something marvelous is here. And I want to talk about this decision because if we look in this direction that John the Baptist is pointing, if we look to the Lamb of God, there's a cost. We will lose our false wings. There's a reward And this sermon is about the cost of looking to the sun and the reward of looking to the sun, the Lamb of God. Now, now we could be prudent. The, the advice that Icarus had, don't fly so high. Don't fly so low. 
stay at a safe distance. There, there's a danger if you go to this sun. Be safe. Remain at a distance. But, but John the Baptist, he says, Behold, come close. And this sermon is about three false wings that we lose should we behold the sun. The first false wing we lose are our plans. The second false wing we lose are our righteousness. And the third false wing we lose are our truth. So, now, John chapter 1, verse 30, John the Baptist's testimony, this was the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. God is faithful from the past. God is faithful to the future. John the Baptist, he puts himself in the middle. John chapter 1 verse 30. This is he whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. John the Baptist puts himself in the middle. Jesus is both after him, Jesus is both before him. <coughs> now, now, when we drive the car, we have a GPS. It's a computer that gives us a map and it tells us how to go from one point to another. And sometimes we have our yearly plan. And this is our GPS. What are we going to do from month to month? What is my plan for this year? For my career? For my family? For my health? What, what plan do I have? But John the Baptist does not talk about his own plan. John the Baptist, John chapter 1 verse 30, he's talking about God's faithful plan. John the Baptist understands, I am within God's faithful plan. See, a compass always points to true north. Should we have a compass, the arrow will always point to true north, and from that we can know north and south. And should we be like John the Baptist? John chapter 1, verse 30. This is the one I said when, when this is the one I meant when I said, a man has surpassed me because he's after me. And he's also before me. John's compass, God, God is God's plan. God had a plan from eternity before me. God has a plan in eternity after me. And God is always faithful to his plan. See, in John the Baptist's compass, one direction points past the second direction points future. 
But John the Baptist understands I am within God's faithful plan. Hope understands God's plan. Faith sees God's plan. Should we read in Hebrews 11 verse 13 about the saints of old living by faith? All these people were still living by faith when they died. and They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. And Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. John, like all the saints of Hebrews chapter 11, knows that God has made a promise. Hebrews 11, 16, God has prepared a city for us from the past. And John understands that there is a city awaiting ahead to the future. Hebrews 11, verse 13. All these people were living by faith when they died. And they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted they're foreigners and strangers on earth. John the Baptist says, I know God is faithful to his plan. God made all these promises in the Old Testament. God promised Abraham descendants. Genesis chapter 15 verse 5. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. God promised David a son. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. 2 Samuel 7, verse 12 and 13. God speaks of his son. Psalm chapter 2, verse 6. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree... The Lord said to me, you are my son. And so, to all these promises that God had made in the past, John is saying, behold, this man who's coming has fulfilled all of them. John chapter 1, verse 30. This is the one I meant when I said, A man has surpassed me because he was before me. Jesus is the end of God's faithful plan. Jesus is eternally first. Jesus is eternally last. Jesus is always before us. Jesus is always after us. 
in John chapter 1, verse 30, is this word, um, um, When we look, when we look at John chapter 1 verse 30, the most literal reading, the most literal Greek I had, this is he as to who he was said, after me comes a man who was before me, because first of me he was. Um, where, where, where it says, he was before me, by Allen New Testament, first of me, protos of me, he was. Jesus is first. Jesus is the image of God we were created in. God is first. When, when God speaks of himself, Isaiah chapter 48 verse 12, listen to me Jacob, listen to me Israel whom I have called, I am he, I am the first, and I am the last. Only God speaks of himself as first and last. Only Jesus speaks of himself as first and last. Revelation 22 verse 12. And behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to their work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first, eternally first, and the last. No man can be at two places at the same time, two opposite places. But John chapter 1 verse 30, Isaiah 48, 12. God is outside of time. God is not bound by time. God from eternity made a plan for his glory. And John the Baptist knows God is faithful to his plan. So, so if God is faithful to his plan, John 1.30, a man comes after me who has surpassed me because he was before me. What is God's plan? Who is God's plan for? God's plan is for sinners. John chapter 1 verse 29. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John again is pointing to Jesus' uniqueness. Jesus' sinlessness. God is holy. God is good. God has no darkness in him. And the Lamb of God, God's sinless offering the unique Son of God. Behold, God's Son, 
from before the beginning to after the end without sin. Yeah. But the first point of this sermon, we have our yearly plan, but it, it does not compare to God's eternal plan. And, and we also, if we are honest, may say, well, I have a plan for sin. I won't have a lot of sin. Y yes, I, I did lose my temper with that person five years ago. And yes, I did drink a lot in my younger days. But that was a long time ago. My plan for sin is... I just won't have a lot. I'll be basically good. God will forgive me because I'm basically a good person who's nice to my neighbors. I only have some sin, just a little. <laughs> no big deal. You know? Even if there is a God, he'll be forgiving. I'm a mostly pretty good person. I've been faithful to my wife. I've raised my children. I've done everything mostly pretty good. But should we look... John chapter 1, verse 29. Behold, God has his own plan for sin. And whatever our plan to deal with sin is, Our righteousness, our self-righteousness, like these wings of wax. When we turn to the sun, all of our self-righteousness and our appraisal of sin, they fall down. Like Icarius' wings. John chapter 1 verse 20 Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. By our calculation we consider sin small. God considers all sin deadly. Cain sinned. He killed his brother. Cain found out sin brings punishment. Genesis chapter 4 verse 13. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. The Israelites sinned. Numbers chapter 14, verse 18. Numbers 14. They rebelled against God. Sin causes guilt. Numbers 14, verse 18. He by no means clears the guilty, but he visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Numbers 14, verse 18. God by no means clears the guilty. And whatever sin we commit incurs our true guilt. Guilt. 
sin makes us slaves. The cost of sin is freedom, true freedom. Proverbs chapter 5 verse 22. His own iniquities entrap the wicked man, and he is caught in the cords of his sin. Where, where Proverbs 5.22 says, the cords of his sin. It means sin has grasped us. It has taken hold of us and will not let us go. So when John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, Jesus bore our punishment. Jesus bore our guilt. And Jesus ends our slavery. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. If we, if we read the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, Isaiah 53, 12, he bore the sin of many, it's nearly identical to John 1, 29. He takes away the sin of the world. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, we have turned everyone to our own way. Consider that God's plan from beginning, from before time, God's plan to the future. And all men, we have turned everyone and we are busy in our own way. Isaiah 53, 6. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus bore the guilt of sin. Jesus bore the punishment of sin. And Jesus frees us from sin. So the second wing we lose when we behold the Lamb of God, our false, our, 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 our false wings of our own righteousness. God's gift, Jesus' righteousness. Romans 8, verse 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ, Christ Jesus. And what does God, what is the cost to behold the Lamb? Admit we are a sinner. Admit we have gone our own way. Psalm 32, verse 5. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, 
whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. Behold the Lamb. By faith, Jesus' righteousness is ours. He died to take away our guilt, our punishment, our sin. By faith in him, we have righteousness. We are given righteousness by faith in him. So, so, so far, we have had two costs of obeying this command at John 129. Behold the Lamb of God. We have given our own plan for our life, and we have gained God's plan for eternity. We have given our own plan for dealing with sin, our righteousness, and we have gained Jesus' grace for our sins. John 1.30 points to Jesus' eternal deity. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man preferred before me, for he was before me. John chapter 1 verse 29 points to Jesus' perfect sinlessness as the Son of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But there is the, the third title, distinct title, for Jesus. John chapter 1, verse 33. Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. God gives the Holy Spirit. Jesus is God. Jesus gives the Holy Spirit. The, the third title of Christ's deity, he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And in three ways, John points to Jesus' deity. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit points all men to truth. And when we behold the Lamb of God, the last of our false wings that fall away is our truth. Truth is God's gift. The Holy Spirit is God's gift. John chapter 14, verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit points us to truth. Why, I hope, as you read the Bible day by day and week by week, what, what compulsion points you to God's Word? Why come to this 
lonely coffee shop to sing hymns and hear God's word. Why have hope from before time began to after eternity the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit points us to the graces of God. The Holy Spirit points us to God's Word. The Holy Spirit points us to God's truth. Those kids out there walking on the sidewalk, who cares about truth? Who cares about God's Word? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit points us to truth. Jesus is the truth. Um, John chapter 1 verse 29. The Holy Spirit points to Jesus. John chapter 1 verse 33. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus. The Holy Spirit pointed to Jesus. He is God's truth. But the Holy Spirit points us to truth. John chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is for your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin. I could say he will convict the world of the truth of sin. Because there is a truth of sin. Sin brings punishment, guilt, slavery. The Holy Spirit convicts of the truth of sin. John chapter 16, verse 7. He will convict the world of righteousness because there is a truth of righteousness. The Holy Spirit will convict the world of judgment because there is a truth of judgment. John chapter 16 verse 9, the truth of sin. He will convict the world of sin because men do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. John chapter 16, God gives repentance. 1985, 35 years ago, oh, I, I decided God's real. Yeah, John chapter 3, Jesus is in heaven. I didn't know what I was doing. I prayed the sinner's prayer. I was baptized 
Eastern Illinois University. It's the Holy Spirit. Sinner, your conscience is pricking you. I've been ignoring God. I don't think God's real. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. The Holy Spirit uses truth. John chapter 16, verse 8. This word, convict. It means to expose, to cross-examine, to convict, to refute an opponent. And the Holy Spirit, with the preaching of the gospel, with the work of the church, the Holy Spirit is constantly pointing the sinner to the truth. And the sinner, in love with sin, in slavery to sin, suppresses the truth. The Holy Spirit's weapon, truth, repentance. John chapter 16, verse 9. He will convict the world about sin because people do not believe in me. Jesus is the Lamb of God, whom God gave to take away your sin. John chapter 16, verse 10. He will convict the world about righteousness because I am going to the Father. Why do we have joy in church? Because God is the living God. Allah is not a living God. Buddha is not a living God. Christ rose from the dead. Christ is the living God. We live by faith, believing in the resurrected Savior. And the Holy Spirit is the one who is pointing us to this righteousness. John 16, 10, he will convict the world of righteousness because Jesus has gone to the Father. John chapter 16, verse 11, he will prove the world to be wrong about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. The Holy Spirit points us to the reality of Satan, the prince of this world. John chapter 12, verse 31. Now is the time for the judgment of this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. It's in your bulletin on the back side. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Jesus gives us victory over Satan. By faith in Jesus, we have entered God's kingdom and we have left Satan's kingdom. But the third false wing that falls away is our truth. The Holy Spirit gives God's truth. John 16, 7 through 11. 
Jesus is our sacrifice for sin. Jesus is our hope for eternal life, our righteousness. And Jesus has rescued us from the kingdom of Satan. The Holy Spirit teaches. The Holy Spirit abides with us forever. 1 John 3, verse 24. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, because we keep his commandments. The Holy Spirit continually teaches us with God's word, with Jesus' commandments. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14 to 17. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Jesus, one sacrifice, has made us perfect, justified before God forever. But then Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14, those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit makes us like God. The Holy Spirit separates us to be holy like God. Mm -hmm. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 15 and 16. The Holy Spirit testifies about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. The Holy Spirit writes God's laws on our hearts. The Holy Spirit writes God's laws on our minds. He points us to God's word, making us holy. So, so this sermon has been an invitation. John chapter 1, verse 29. Behold the Lamb, draw close to the Lamb. When we draw close to the Lamb, we lose our plans, we gain God's plan. When we draw close to the Lamb, we lose our righteousness, we gain Jesus' righteousness. And the Holy Spirit, who is calling us, we lose our truth and we become servants and testify to God's truth. Jesus is the atonement for our sin. Jesus is the hope of eternal life. Jesus is the victory over the devil. Behold the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. God's grace lead us to his Son. God's grace free us as we continue to behold and live in his son. 
Uh, let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Pray that you give us grace and, and continue to encourage us to be your servants. And just be with us this year and, and sure. teach us your ways. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.